Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to this session on Europe. My name is Alison Delmore. I'm the Associate Director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm pleased to be moderating today's panel. Before we begin, I want to make a special thanks to our partners who are joining us um, at our partner institutions, um, University of Illinois and University of Florida, I see. We may be joined later, hello. We may be joined later by um, Tech and Florida International University. And to um, the colleagues at those partner centers who helped make this all possible and technology to, to do this. Conversations on Europe is a monthly series that we are able to do thanks to the support of the University of Pittsburgh, um, the European Commission through our John Monet Center of Excellence grant, and with funding from our Title VI National Resource Centers grant from the U.S. Department of Education. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my colleagues at the center and um, around the university who contribute their time and expertise <coughs> to making these kinds of conversations and the remote connections possible. Today's session was inspired by the European Studies Center's Year of Memory and Politics series. And as previous events have looked at other aspects of memory politics, today we'll look specifically at physical monuments, statues and other memorials, um, and looking at a particularly ones that have become the focus of protest, debate, debates, or other forms of contestation. So that said, I'm gonna start with a little personal vignette. So <laughs> almost two years ago, on April 26, 2018, on my normal morning ride to work, I remember being particularly struck by this very unusual sight of a truck towing a large and familiar bronze statue through the streets of Pittsburgh. <laughs> this was the 1,000 pound, 10 foot high statue of Pittsburgh's native son and antebellum songwriter, Stephen Foster. And it was being towed away from the place where it had rested for many years in a bustling neighborhood, um, just about a block from where we're sitting right now. It had become, um, a, it had long been a source of controversy, but it, that had been stirred up um, more particularly in, in, in the period um, surrounding its removal um, after the events of the deadly protests in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so it was pretty clear that this odd site was a part of a larger national. But, of course, calls for removing Confederate monuments, other monuments such as the statue of um, Stephen Foster, um, and removing other symbols from public parks or grounds from pub of public universities can be situated within a larger global movement. And so today's session, we've invited a number of um, scholars to talk to us about how the U.S. compares with Europe in particular, what is going on in, this, in their global movement, and to sort of situate this all in context. And so I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, historians and art historians who are joining us today. First, joining me in person on my right is Professor Kurt Stavage, who is Professor and Chair of the History of Art and Architecture here at Pitt, and has written extensively on public monuments within the larger theoretical context of collective memory and identity. He is the author or, or editor of three prize-winning books, which we will link to on our website when this video is posted. And, but among them are The Civil War um, in Art and Memory in 2016, and Monument Wars, Washington, D.C., the National Mall, and the Transformation of the Memorial Landscape in 2009. Joining us from Charlottesville is um, Jennifer Sessions. Uh, Dr. Sessions is Associate Professor of History at the University of Virginia. She is a historian of modern France and the French Overseas Empire, with an emphasis on French relations with North Africa, particularly Algeria, and interest in comparative empires, settler, settler colonialism, and cultural history. Her prize-winning first book was entitled By Sword and Plow, France and the Conquest of Algeria in 2011. She's currently working on a study of, among other things, on a study of the French equestrian statue that stood in the center of Algiers from 1845 to the end of the colonial period. Um, joining us then from Tennessee um, is Dr. Brian Quova. He's an assistant professor of African-American history at the University of Memphis. 
His research centers on political and social movements among people of African descent in the United States and across the globe. While completing his doctoral degree at Oxford, he co-founded the Oxford Pan-African Forum and the Roads Must Fall in Oxford Movement, which made Oxford's statue of Cecil Rhodes a focal point for wider challenges to coloniality in the university's iconography, curriculum, and racial demographics. And makes him perfect for this panel. <laughs> um, Dr. Kuova co-edited the book, Roads Must Fall, The Struggle to Decolonize the Racist Heart of Empire. He's currently revising his doctoral dissertation into a book manuscript <laughs> about the New Negro Movement and the unsung early 20th century um, father of Harlem radicalism, Hubert Henry Harrison. And finally, uh, joining us from the farthest away in Germany, um, our colleague, Dr. Katja Wetzel. Katja is a research associate at the University of Göttingen and the former DAAD visiting professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and we miss her very much. <laughs> she works on Baltic history, particularly memory politics and post-communist Latvia, and publishing in, on that topic in German as Geschichte aus Polit Politikum, Lettland und die Aufarbeitung nach der Taktik. Sorry. And which roughly translates as history as politics reprocessing dictatorship in Latvia in 2016. Her current project is on the cosmopolitan city, Riga, as a global port and international capital of trade, 1861 to 1939, and has received funding from the federal government commissioner for culture and media in Germany. So thank you all for joining us. Welcome to our discussion. And just to throw out sort of where I first kind of brought it, was you know, sort of my personal very small connection to seeing this weird statue being towed um, through the streets. And I wonder if we could just start situating the, this moment in time in, in context. So I'm going to turn first to my colleague on my right and just ask Kurt if you could help us kind of um, think about what's, what's been going on in the U.S. over the past five years and what, what's been happening with these sort of protests over monuments. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I really appreciate the chance to actually talk about this in a more global forum because I think the connections are really interesting, and I'm I'm looking forward to uh, learning from you, but also you know suggesting a few ways maybe in which we could think more globally about the United States because of course here in the United States we're constantly dealing with American exceptionalism, so everything that happens in America is is unique and exceptional when it's not necessarily the case. Um, so there's a long history of monument removal in this country and around the world. Uh, and it's not as if uh, this began with, um, in 2015, Confederate monuments. This was not the first time that monuments were removed in the United States. They've been removed. Uh, there have been a lot of monument removals that have happened for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes political ones, uh, things that become politically embarrassing are removed and have been in the past. Uh, some prominent examples might be the two sculptural groups in front of the US Capitol were removed in the 1950s. They both, one was a Columbus monument with a figure of a, at a supposedly native woman, naked woman cowering at the feet of Columbus. That was removed. There was another, uh, a companion group removed that was called the Pioneer that was about uh, you know a savage a group of savage Indians being restrained by a civilized pioneer figure who sort of looks like Erasmus or something like that. Anyway, so those groups were removed in the late 1950s largely because of um, what had been uh, increasing the increasing voice of Native Americans in the political process in the federal in in the federal um, political process at that point in time in the mid 20th century. So we have, a, we have a history of that. We also have a history of monuments just being removed because they became totally obsolete. Nobody cared about them anymore. There was a road project there and nobody was there to advocate for the monument, so it was taken down. Or because it became aesthetically embarrassing. And so these are, there are many, many reasons why it's happened. Having said that, obviously we're in a different we're in a different period right now with the, the Confederate memorials and our, our own Stephen Foster monument here. Because what we're seeing now is a much more systematic intervention, much more organized and much more pervasive across 
the country. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of monuments now coming under attack, not just from Confederate monuments, but also settler colonial monuments, you know, monuments to pioneers uh, that have been removed in San Francisco recently, for example. Um, so we're seeing a number and a, a number of different kind of strands coming together and people connecting the dots across different kind of monument domains. So I'm, what I'm going to suggest here, what I think would be interesting for the panel to take up is, is trying to connect those dots and to see what, how, what is happening, um, what, what are the reasons for this more systematic campaign against public monuments. Today And I think um, what we're really talking about, what unifies the various kinds of monuments that are coming under attack now, are these are all monuments that represent white rule or white supremacy. Uh, so they were often erected simply not necessarily to actively glorify white supremacy, though that is the case with Confederate monuments. But um, simply the presupposition was that, you know, uh, they, they reflect a presupposition of white rule and white privilege that went unchallenged because of the absence of other, you know, non-white voices in the, in the civil, in civil society and in the political sphere who could challenge them. So I think then what ties together some of, you know, what's been happening with the Rhodes case in, England and, and also in South Africa, or what's happening with uh, settler colonial monuments in Australia and the United States, uh, or the reconsideration of slavery, the commemoration of slavery in Britain and here. What we're seeing across all these fields, I think, is we're challenging the um, celebration of figures who are deeply implicated in these uh, in white supremacy in one form or another, right? Whether it be through settler colonialism, whether it be through slavery, whether it be through apartheid regimes or you know um, Jim Crow regimes here in the United States, uh, and so we have gotten to uh, we've reached a point where there is now a critical mass of of um, opposition to these, and where certain voices that had never had a place in the commemorative sphere have been empowered to actually push back and demand a different kind of history told in public space or a challenge to that default history that we have been living with for so long. Um, so obviously, I think this is a good thing. <laughs> I, think, I think we should be connecting these issues. It's not just about con Confederate monuments are the most egregious because, in a sense, because that was a nation entirely dedicated to the proposition that slavery had to, slavery of African descent, people of African descent had to be perpetuated in this country uh, or in North America. Um, and that was the sole reason for this nation to exist. So it was completely built on, totally on a foundation of white supremacy. Um, but you know, when when um, Trump asked the question after Charlottesville, when, where does it stop, right? We can take down an equestrian statue of Robert E. Lee, but where does it stop? Um, I have to admit that this was actually a legitimate question because, in fact, it shouldn't stop at Robert E. Lee. It should. We should actually be looking at a whole universe of monuments that. Um, that are all deeply implicated in white supremacy. And I understand this doesn't really get to the communists, the post-Soviet um, case, which is a bit different. But what I think my final remark here will be that, in a sense, what unites these cases, I believe, is that we are in a kind of regime change, right? So it's, it was obvious in the post-Soviet world that the statues of the old regime had to go. And we have a long history of that, you know, in France and elsewhere, right, of tearing down the monuments of the previous regime. I think we are in a sort of slow motion. We're in a slow motion kind of process now of looking at the regime of white supremacy and how do we, you know, tear down or revise or work, you know, how do we revise that? that Ancien Regime and come up with a new way of telling, a new story to tell. So I'll leave it at that.
and um, look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks. That brings up a lot of really great um, food for thought. And I think we're going to cover a lot of that as we go. And, but let's take as a starting point this idea of kind of connecting the dots. And so I'm going to pass it off to um, maybe we'll start with Brian. If you could add in some more of the dots where you intersect and maybe talk a little bit about um, um, the roads must fall movement and your connection there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, <coughs> I think Kirk is right. Um, to talk, you know, that it's really great to talk about this in a global context, because Roads Must Fall in Oxford was was certainly um, born of, of a global context in the sense that we really took our lead from South Africa, um, as as people will will probably know. Um, in 2015, there was a black student at the University of Cape Town who um, who threw feces on the statue of Cecil Rhodes there. Um, which ignited a huge, you know, controversy on campus, which essentially developed into a mass movement uh, led by black students at the University of Cape Town, um, not only calling for the removal of Cecil Rhodes, who's a noxious and, you know, brutal colonizer in Southern Africa, um, but also challenging coloniality in other parts of the university, in the curriculum, uh, in terms of the faculty representation, racial representation of black faculty, of black students, um, the question of outsourcing and black workers at the university. And so we in Oxford really took our lead. Uh, we were watching this, um, some of the students that I was um, connected to through the Oxford Pan-African Forum and through other um, similar efforts. We were inspired by what we saw the black students in South Africa doing. <laughs> and we noticed there's a, a, a statue of Cecil Rhodes in Oxford as well. And so what started <laughs> off, what, what started off as uh, solidarity actions with the South African students turned into a sort of proper Rhodes Must Fall movement of our own in, in Oxford. We felt that the best way we could show solidarity would be to challenge uh, Rhodes and the whole colonial, you know, sort of mentality that he represents right in the belly of the beast in the UK. Um, because not only is the Rhodes statues there, there's the Rhodes House, uh, which houses the, the Rhodes Scholarship. There's other symbols like the uh, Codrington statue, a statue to Christopher Codrington, who was, I think, the largest uh, plantation owner in Barbados and enslaved uh, many Africans, you know, in the Caribbean and so on and so forth. And of course, in the curriculum, uh, we, we saw all kinds of instances of, of coloniality and um, the predominance of this sort of stale, pale males um, in the Western canon on reading lists and syllabi for the humanities, for example. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the things that I think we found was, was difficult is that the UK, just as a terrain to talk, <laughs> challenging, challenging legacies of empire in the UK was just really hard um, because I think the education system there and the, just the general culture um, is, is sort of much more glorifying of the, the Cecil Rhodeses and other British colonizers and imperialists. Um, there was a poll that, that came out that showed roughly uh, half and half. Some people, you know, had criti were critical of the British Empire, but the other half were nostalgic for empire. And so, um, so one of the things that I think was much harder there was just racial, the racial discourse and racial awareness um, I found to be much, much behind where it is in the U.S. Um, you know, the chancellor of Oxford said things like, well, if students don't like the architecture, maybe they should study elsewhere. And that kind of response, um, I think, is less common here in the U.S. because there is more racial awareness. You know, we had a civil war. Uh, we had a civil rights movement. We have a much larger um, African-American population and a rich tradition of, of struggle by and for African-Americans. And so all of that, I think, makes for an environment where it's, it's relatively um, easier, I think, to challenge some of these things. I mean, the, the Rhodes statue in Oxford still stands precisely because um, of some of the issues I'm talking about, just the difficulty getting traction with this conversation. Um, and then in South Africa, of course, racial awareness is, I would say, even higher than in the US in some ways. I mean, it's a majority black country, um, and the struggle against apartheid is still quite fresh. Um, in the minds of people, much more fresh than, say, you know, the civil rights movement for us here in the U.S., um, just because it happened more recently. And so, um, and so, yeah, that was that was a really interesting thing. We also encountered this argument: where does it stop? 
Um, and I think that points to the fear that um, some of the elite forces we were challenging have about this, this question. It's like, once you challenge Cecil Rhodes, well, then you have to question a whole lot of other figures, right? Um, and, and you have to question some fundamental things about the culture and the society in which you live at that point, uh, given that Britain, you know, really British development is, is so rooted in empire and imperialism and, and slavery and so on and so forth. Um, so the British media really was was like going crazy about us. I mean, just really, really um, amazing things that <laughs> like they, they couldn't even engage with our arguments. They tried to call it. They tried to say that we were like ISIS because supposedly ISIS wanted to was tearing down statues somewhere and we wanted to supposedly tear down statues. And therefore, we're just like ISIS, you know, which, again, is sort of interesting when you think about um, <laughs> the way in which anti-colonial resistance often was branded as terrorism um, rather than taken seriously as, as you know, a legitimate set of grievances and concerns, um, particularly for the African students there. So I guess that's the point I'll end on is just that um, <clears throat> when I first got to Oxford, I was shocked because the African Studies Library was being housed in the Cecil Rhodes house. And I was saying to people like, <laughs> I was, saying, I, was, I was trying to explain to people, like, imagine if there was a Jewish studies library housed in the Adolf Hitler house. I mean, we can't even imagine an Adolf Hitler house, but certainly we can't imagine a Jewish studies library housed there. And so um, what that meant for the lived experience of African students, particularly Southern African students who are the descendants of those Rose colonized, um, you know, is, is hard to put into words because you literally are walking past iconographies every day that are um, an affront and an insult to your existence in some ways or to your legitimacy as a full human being deserving of, of rights and respect. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, um, there's a global shift happening. I think there's an awareness about um, statues and about um, the way in which, you know, some of these statues just, just need to come down. And the difficulty of an institution like Oxford to actually do that, I think, speaks to how entrenched um, some of these ideologies and, and some of these legacies are. Um, even when you call them out and bring some publicity to them, there's still this really sort of dogged determination sometimes um, to prevent change at all costs. And my thing is like, look, if Walt Disney can take down, if Disney World can take down a statue of Bill Cosby uh, for good reason, <laughs> then, then, surely, then surely we should be able to take down statues of people who, who have even more blood on their hands. So again, bringing up so many awesome points, and I want to keep connecting the dots, and then we'll come back and fill in some of these blanks. So let me throw it down to um, Jen. Um, where can can you point out some more dots that we can we can help connect in terms of thinking about um, French former colonies or French places in the French Empire or really anything that that comes yeah. to mind? Okay. So yeah, I think um, this is a really interesting conversation. And please forgive my scratchy voice. I, ha I have a, I have a cold here. You have maybe noticed the the Kleenex and the tea, um, but. Uh, but I think that if we're thinking about colonial monuments, some of what Brian said, I think I could kind of maybe make a little bit more explicit um, because I think, you know, we certainly can talk about a larger kind of transatlantic global movement against statues. Um, but I think, yeah, it wouldn't be a story if I didn't say it's more complicated than that. Um, and I think there are maybe three things that, that we want to keep in mind um, that calls to remove statues in formerly colonized places and in Europe, in the case of overseas empire, in the United States as a continental empire is a different case, um, are, are different, right? So, so the way that it unfolds, the forces that are at work um, in, in Europe and in, in places formerly colonized by Europe is not, not the same. Um, we need to pay attention to timing um, right, as, as Kirk pointed out, taking down monuments and statues is nothing new. Um, and so what it means to take down monuments and why they come down at certain points in time is, is you know, very much connected to the larger histories and, and contexts. Um, and then I think the, the, the you know, your opening um, 
anecdote about about Pittsburgh is really important um, is how important the local is in in these movements. So so let me give you um, a couple of examples. So drawing on my research on French Algeria, for instance, colonial statues in Algeria um, were taken down in the 1960s right at the moment, sometimes literally at the very moment on the eve of independence in July of 1962, um, in ways that are very much connected to a very long tradition of re revolutionary iconoclasm, right? The French understood this. They actually preemptively took down monuments that they thought were, were sensitive to protect them against, you know, they called it profanation by Algerian nationalists. Um, and then, but the ones that were that were still there when the French withdrew in 1962, you know, Algerian nationalists sometimes in organized ways, sometimes in in kind of more spontaneous ways, you know, attacked and destroyed many of the ones that were left behind. Um, but they didn't attack all of them, and I think the the monuments that survive are just as important and point to that that importance of the local. So um, if we look at the Algerian memorial landscape now, the things that tended to um, make it through decolonization are things like monuments to the soldiers of World War I that included Algerians who fought with the French armies, um, fountains that stand in the center of communities that still use them for water sources or are kind of spaces of everyday life, um, things that had meaning in local communities that go beyond representations of colonial power, which they also did, um, but but they represented colonial power in different ways at different times. Um, and so some of those memorials are not now, you know, only kind of recently being challenged. And there's a very famous kind of puzzling case in the, the city of Setif in, in Algeria, for example, where there's a fountain that dates to the 1890s that has a female nude figure on it. And it was actually like very kind of, you know, valued in the local community. It survived decolonization. Um, and it was only in the 1990s that there started to be attacks on that monument um, in the middle of the Algerian Civil War when, um, when Islamist conservatives decided that the nude female figure was not acceptable. And so there was an attempt to like bomb it. Um, it was rebuilt by the local community. Then, you know, in the early 2000s, somebody attacked it with a hammer. Um, it was again repaired by the community. And then it was attacked again just a couple of years ago. So, um, and each time the local community has repaired it. So the the, the dynamics are, are, um, are kind of complicated. And, you know, there are lots of other um, instances like that that we could appoint to. The, um, one of my favorites is the statue of Empress Josephine in Martinique in Fort de France, which is still part of France. Um, which was left intact through most of the 20th century, despite Josephine kind of representing, um, you know, French colonial power because politicians in Martinique wanted to kind of situate the island as both Caribbean and French. And then in the early 1990s, somebody whacked the head off the statue and threw red paint over it. Um, and as, as a very explicit protest, there are inscriptions that, that were made at the same time, you know, that basically this was a condemnation of Napoleon's re-imposition of slavery, um, which Josephine was, was associated with. Um, you know, the head is now still missing, the red paint remains, and the, now this sort of defigured monument is a monument to the failure to recognize abolition or to maintain abolition. Um, so, so we can we can point to a lot of places where the the timeline of attacks on colonial monuments um, is quite different from what um, I think Kirk was describing in in the American case, um, and and it is very much about local dynamics and local politics. Um, if we switch our attention to Europe and look at sort of formerly colonizing states in Europe, where you know there are lots of statues that are associated with colonial imperial conquests and slavery um, that have largely been ignored for a long time and are, I think, as part of this new moment being challenged in, in more systematic ways um, and, and are often directly inspired even in the names of the movements by Roads Must Fall or the Take Em Down movement in the United States. 
Um, but what's interesting there is that at least in the French case, they've gotten very little traction and particularly movements that are calling for the removal of statues associated with Algeria, the conquest of Sub-Saharan Africa, Indochina, um, the one movement that has kind of gotten at least some public discussion has to do with figures associated with slavery and the slave trade, and particularly Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the 17th century minister who, who was um, in power when the French, the black code that legalized and regulated slavery was written. Um, and there's now a movement in France to, to rename schools and streets that are named for Colbert and maybe take down some of the, those monuments. Um, but I think what's telling is that no statues have actually been removed. Um, some streets have been renamed, but um, for the most part, activists have been much more successful in getting sites added to the memorial landscape than getting things taken away. Um, and I think, you know, we could talk about the reasons why I won't maybe um, for the interest of brevity won't go into it now. Um, but I think that that's the, the things that have changed are the things that are small, that are low stakes, particularly street names, and that are in the control of municipalities. Um, and so thing, you know, shifting things at the national level is much harder um, than at the local level. And I think you can see, you know, here in Charlottesville, very similar dynamics where, you know, the fight right now in the Virginia state legislature, which I think we're gonna, um, is, will be, you know, will go ahead um, as the legislative session unfolds, is not about a statewide law to remove monuments, but about giving municipalities the power to remove monuments if they so choose. Um, and so, so I think, you know, we really need to pay attention to the local as well as these larger connections. Yeah, that's great. And again, I'm jotting down all these, so we'll come back to them, but I want to continue moving, now that we've gotten back to Europe, I want to continue moving east and um, thinking again about some maybe continental empires or spaces within Eastern Europe. So I'm I'm going to throw it now to you, Katya, to see where you can add some more of these dots. Yes, thank you very much. So I do actually see quite a lot of similarities to the cases that have just been described, uh, because uh, to me it's all about contested history. So of course, uh, after the end of the um, Soviet Empire, so to say, uh, it wasn't contested to bring down the Lenin Monument. But uh, the contested monuments are the one about World War II. And that's, of course, related to the fact that uh, there are very different narratives about World War II and why, what happened during World War II. So to, to give just one example, that's probably one of the best known ones is the ground soldier in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, it's a, a Soviet war memorial that has been built in 1947. Uh, and uh, after Estonia became independent in 1991, this became a contested site simply because uh, Estonia and the Estonians never believed it was their monument. They didn't. They they, they saw it as a monument of the Soviets and the Russians, re respectively. And so for them, uh, you could even argue there is a colonial, maybe even a colonial angle here because. Uh, the Soviet government has been seen as a colonial colonial power as well by Estonians. That's one side of it. But the other side is, of course, that the Soviets always uh, interpreted this as the monument about, well, those soldiers that liberated Estonia from Nazi Germany, whereas Estonians said, well, yeah, duh, the, 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 the Nazis went, but the Soviets came and we had a new occupation by Soviet soldiers. So those soldiers that are there and they're buried there, so under the under the monument, they actually buried Soviet soldiers were seen as members of the occupying forces. So um, after 1991, what they first did, they were trying to essentially redefine the monument and say this is a monument about everybody who uh, who who. Who lost anyone in World War II for all the fallen soldiers, but the, the, this simply didn't work because the ones that still went to this monument on May 9th, which was the big celebration day for the end of World War II, 
studies in Kenya and continues to be today in Russia, the ones that went there were the Russian-speaking population in Estonia. And, and so what you also see there is the split in society. So you have the two different narratives, the uh, Estonian-speaking population and the Russian-speaking population in Tallinn, who had very different ideas as to what this monument meant. And I see a lot of similarities here um, to, to the kind of monuments that sparked protests in the United States, where we also have a split society, essentially, split along different lines, but nevertheless, um, a split society where you have very different narratives about the past and very different understandings about the past. So in the case of Estonia, in the case of, of, um, of, of Tallinn, and in 2007, the government decided to remove the memorial and to relocate it to a military cemetery. And that then sparked large protests among the Russian-speaking population and riots that lasted for days. And uh, finally, there was even, well, there was quite a crisis between Russia and Estonia, cyber attacks uh, on Estonian websites, etc. So there was a real conflict between Russia and Estonia both having very different understanding about their very recent history. Great, yeah, really interesting. So I've written down a number of things that we can address as we go through, but I also want to urge people in joining us from the remote audiences, but also here in, um, in uh, at Pitt, if you have questions too, I want to leave open a chance for you to ask your questions. So think about what they might be, and I'll and I'll throw it up in a minute. But we've had a lot of things coming up: this sort of local responses, the responses by those in authority, and how those um, how those compare over spaces and with different cases. Um, where does it stop? I think is a question that keeps coming up, and you'll get that as part of the responses from authority as well. Um, and moments that are um, successes versus those that are failures, um, why now, all of this has come up. And I guess what I want to throw to you next is this idea, um, just to, to start us somewhere <laughs> with all this great stuff, is the idea of these contested meanings, right? How meaning is conveyed or is interpreted differently by different groups looking at the monuments. Um, and so I wanted to kind of look at monuments themselves, you know, and go back to what is the what is the purpose of these monuments? Where why are they built in the first place? And how is the meaning conveyed through them? Is there a purpose for a kind of public monument? Uh, well, I suppose I should jump in. Um, uh, Yes, and there, there's always a present day purpose, right? So uh, we are commemorating something in the past, but the only reason that that happens is because there is a group of people powerful enough with an agenda that they are pursuing in their own present day and moment to um, create a commemorative project. And these things are, these require money, they require, you know, land or they require site public sites so they require you know it takes a lot to you know it's not just something that an ordinary person can do um so i would say that you know a big part of this question around contested meanings is who's at the table in the first place you know who's at the table uh when the in in the commemorative sphere who has the ability to actually you know advance a project uh, and for what reasons? Uh, so that these questions then often become revolve around you know disempowerment and disenfranchisement because m many 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 groups in society were never consulted about these monuments to begin with you know so they never had a voice in them. Uh, they it's not as if these monuments somehow in some kind of organic way reflect the will and memory of the people. It's just not the way it works. <clears throat> and so I think a lot of what's happening now is, 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 a, is an attempt for other people and other voices to get to the table here. And that's when we start to have contested meanings because we now no longer have a singular authority who can impose a meaning on 
uh, the commemorative landscape. I'm interested in some examples that were pointed out of ways in which um, people who were maybe disenfranchised from the creation of it managed to impose new meanings on the statues um, or on these memorials. So cutting off Josephine's head changes, changes the meaning of it, right? So are there other examples there? Is that is that the way that, you know, is that one of the responses, another responses to protest and, and, and get it removed? Where do these things go? What happens to these statues? Jen. So that, yeah. I, um, okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I think what, what Katya mentioned is, um, in terms of you know, moving, trying to move them out of public space into spaces that are more restrained. So the case of the French monuments in Algeria is really interesting. Um, in the spring of 1962, as the French government is negotiating the terms of independence with the with the Algerian nationalist movement, um, the they they actually send the psychological operations units out to take an inventory of the monuments in across the colony um, to determine which of them will be sensitive um, and this ends up being ones that are particularly associated with the French army of, of conquest in the 19th century um, and what they do is that they they try to gather them up and they do exactly the thing that, that Katya said, which is that they try to move them to out of public squares and into cemeteries, into military bases. Um, and then as independence gets closer, they actually take the most important ones and they pack them up and they ship them off back to France. Um, to get them out of Algeria altogether, and the ones that they can't actually pack up and move, they destroy. They dynamite them. They throw the pieces into the Mediterranean Sea. Some of them get dropped out of helicopters into the into the sea, um, and and so there's sort of a, a um, it becomes a problem then because they've got all these ones and now that they've stored in these cemeteries and things, and they have to figure out what to do with them. Because nobody, nobody actually wants them. Um, at least, you know, nobody in Algeria. So they kind of put them up for grabs um, to communities or groups in France that might have an interest and be willing to take on the expense of reinstalling them somewhere else. And you get this process where, you know, local communities, you know, say the the birthplace of like the surgeon Blondin. Who had been, you know, had a statue in, you know, this one town in Algeria where he died, you know, the place where he was born takes this statue and puts it up in a place where nobody remembers who he is. And so those statues are now mostly still there in the places that they were reinstalled. Um, and one of the questions that's come up is, you know, in places where people have said, well, let's, we, we should really take these down, these colonial soldiers, People don't know enough about what they mean for that to actually become really, um, to, for that to gain any traction in in local politics. Um, and I think that that that's sort of indicative of the importance of the local and the and the kind of the context because I think that's very different from what happens to you know communist monuments, for instance, that get installed in like parks devoted to the fallen past. Um, and and the debates about what to do with the Confederate statues in in the U.S. Um, as well, but but it's it's it becomes a problem once you have these things that have been discredited. Um, where do you put them? I keep it, um, that song's running through my mind from White Christmas. What do you do with a general when he stops being a general? <laughs> it's a statue. You know, what do you do with a statue when it stops being? Yeah. Nobody cares. Um, yeah, so we have a couple questions in the audience, and I know Brian has to go, so I'll let you go first, Brian, and then we're going to throw it to questions in case they can get you to answer before you do have to leave. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, build on the, the the question of why these things are built, and um, and then also the, this question of, you know, some things can be discredited, but then other things uh, can be still ongoing. 
in ways that make it um, harder to bring down some of these statues. So for example, um, because I think part of why these things go up is, is it's how the dominant group imagines its heroes, right? And so for Cecil Rhodes, you start questioning Cecil Rhodes, you're gonna start questioning colonialism and imperialism. And that is not a thing of the past. Um, the UK uh, joins the US when it you know, wants to wage war in Iraq or war in Afghanistan or war on Libya, right? These are modern day um, imperialist ventures, not to mention all the covert action and drone bombing and so on, um, the less naked and obvious uh, uh, cases of imperialism. And so, um, and so it's, it, it becomes difficult because you're raising questions not just about the past, but about the present as well. Um, and I think that's another reason why. We said that that's, the statues should go to a museum, uh, like the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, which has exhibits about empires in Asia and empires in Mesoamerica, you know, the Mayas and, or the Incas and Aztecs, um, empires in Egypt. But there's no exhibit for the British Empire <laughs> because, <laughs> because, if you, because if you had such an exhibit, then people would actually maybe learn something and start to think critically about British foreign policy today. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick, go ahead. So um, I wanted to add to what Jen just said. Um, there is also a memorial park in Lithuania. They have collected all kinds of Soviet memorials, uh, mostly Lenin, but not only. And there, of course, you now have this this weird feeling when you go there because it has become this tourist attraction, and Lenin has been become something that you almost laugh about. And and of course, the question is to what extent to visitors. Do visitors who go to this park critically reflect on communism and the lives that were destroyed by communist ideology, communist practice? And so um, I don't really know what to think, what to make of these parks. And uh, I agree, um, doing a museum and actually explaining the history next to it probably is the better way of doing it. So. Um, we had a couple questions in the audience. I'm going to start with my colleague on the left here, Bob Hayden. Uh, yeah, um, it's it's going to be a little bit long. I'm not how, sure how much of his question because I want to complicate things a bit when the normative scales change. In a room, in an audience like this, we have no problem with seeing colonialism as having been bad and racism as having been bad. But I work in the Balkans and I work in the former Yugoslavia where the monuments put up after World War II were to the victims of war and fascism. And the communist monuments all ended with death to fascism, freedom to the people. Now, those have been torn down. They've been torn down, and in some places, they have been replaced, not necessarily by monuments, but there are some of those. But by renaming streets and the like, and squares and buildings for the former fascists. Now, there's no question that the communists killed a lot of people. World War II ends on May 9th in Europe, except in Yugoslavia, where it ends on May 15th. And you don't want to look too closely at what happens in that week. And in the several years thereafter, in which they finally decide that the death penalty had lost its meaning. But when you're tearing down monuments to the victims of fascism and replacing them with monuments to some of the fascists, that raises, I think, a whole set of different issues because the normative counters are so, so different. And it does reflect a, a lot of ongoing conflicts within the societies. The president of Croatia, who just lost re-election, had proudly adopted some of the fascist slogans from the World War II fascist state. Now, she lost the election, but she thought it was popular enough to adopt them in the first place. So you have these Conflicts going down. And how does that play into our discourse? Where it's no longer a simple thing. Oh, yeah, you've got to get rid of colonialism. You've got to get rid of racism. And instead, gee, we got to get rid of the guys who took out fascism and bring back the fascists. And that's a non Soviet cut on a lot of Eastern Europe as well. Yeah. So I'm going to let, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it to Jen in just a sec. I'm just going to ask if, if you're at one of the, um, partner centers and you 
question that you want via um, via the online platform, you can do that um, and just send it to us via chat. Okay, Jen, go ahead. Well, it's been because I, I that 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 case is obviously a little bit less clear cut, but I'm not actually sure that the specific that that the 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 specifics are different, but I'm not sure that the dynamics are different because it's still about the contested past, who are the heroes, what are the values that we want to encode in public space. And a slightly, I think, maybe less dramatic but equally revealing example is a is a war of street names in France between representatives of, um, you know, I guess we could broadly divide them into anti-colonialists who want to name streets and particularly public squares for, um, they, they like to name streets for dates in, in France. So, um, so you have a movement to name things to commemorate the end of the Algerian war by naming things for the date on which the peace accords were signed between France and the FLN in March of 1962. Against that, you have another movement led particularly by activists in the former settler community to name or rename those same squares for the anniversary um, about a month later, two months later, of a quote unquote massacre of settlers that took place in May of 1962. Um, and and so there 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 are um, you know I think there there are reactionary forces in much of Europe who are also trying to use monuments and street names in particular to assert a a you know a very imperialist or colonial nostalgic vision of the past as well and I'm, I'm sure Brian has seen some of that in in the UK as well. I'm gonna. I am gonna ask Brian if he has some thoughts um, before he goes, because I know you do have to go to your next class. Um, cool. But if you want to respond to that, but also thinking um, about where do you, you know, as somebody who was involved in the movement as an activist as well, and then now as sort of thinking about it as a scholar too, where does it end? Like, where would you like to see the the? Is it the commemorative landscape that gets changed? Is and 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 how far does the curriculum decolonize? I mean, is there an end? Does there need to be an end? That sort of. Do you have any parting thoughts? Um. Yeah. I guess. Um. On that question. Um. Well, let me let me take the the other one first, which is just uh, yeah, definitely there's a lot of um, nostalgia and people, you know, conservative forces who who want to use monuments for similar purposes. I mean, here in Memphis, Tennessee, um, I was shocked at the level of resistance to bringing down the Confederate monuments to Jefferson Davis and Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, I mean, there was a, a you know a big struggle that activists uh, were waging, and just two years ago, about two years ago, they finally took down these Confederate monuments that were in public parks in Memphis. And I was just really shocked at at the level of resistance, um, including from the mayor, you know, uh, to 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 what should be a basic demand, particularly in a city that is um, almost two thirds African American. Um, but in any case, um, where does it end? I mean, I think I think it's good to do house cleaning once in a while, you know. And so every every statue that's up should 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 get some scrutiny if it if it deserves it. Um, I think it, it's not because the other thing is it's not just taking things down, right? There's also putting things up. So in Maryland, for example, they just recently erected uh, a statue of Frederick Douglass and of Harriet Tubman. Um, two of the most important, you know, um, African American abolitionist uh, figures in our history, um, and so one of the places it can end is uh, by erecting new statues and new monuments that better reflect the kind of values that, um, that 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 the society is evolving towards, or the kind of heroes that we want to to valorize and commemorate. And so I would I would hope that it ends not just with removing all the bad things, but also putting up new things that are good and that um, give young people and others um, somebody to really to respect and to and to truly um, look up to for for good reason. People like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, as Maryland has just done. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us in this in this conversation. There's so much more we can talk about. Um,
and we'll continue to go. I know we have another question, um, Christina. Yes, I have a question for Brian, so I will be very, very brief. I had a chance to take part in some initiatives uh, in Oxford called the Uncastable Oxford Project. So they also go to the Sashimonia Museum and they study how to decolonize the museum. But they also do something very interesting, which I think is related to this question, where, where does it stop? Which is studying uh, the institutional finances and looking, for instance, like, who is Said, who is Blavatnik, which is a relationship with the Panama Papers and Oxford. So how did you see a, maybe a future development, how to interconnect these issues of institutional funding and this kind of movement? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's one of the issues that we started to look at um, because, precisely because one of the reasons for some of these statues being up is that they were given funding. So the Rhodes statue in Oxford, you know, Cecil Rhodes donated a lot of money to Oriel College, which is one of the reasons why there's a Rhodes statue there, right? And, so, and it was the donors, the current day donors of Oriel College, who essentially threatened to withhold continuing donating to the college um, as a way to shut down the conversation and get the college to prevent any more discussion about the issue. Um, and so, yeah, I think the financial, um, the financial questions, or Christopher Codrington, for example, at All Souls College, right? Here's someone who profited immensely from enslavement, so much so that he could endow a library at an Oxford college. And so, um, where, you know, where should that money go now? We talked about uh, demanding scholarships for black students, particularly, you know, Afro-Caribbean students who may have some ancestral connection um, to the type of, or, or whose, whose ancestors uh, may have been exploited to produce the wealth that endowed that, that library, right? Um, I think these are the types of restorative uh, justice measures, um, reparations or repairing, repairing the damage done, if you want to talk about it that way, um, that could be very valuable, you know, scholarships for, for students from uh, colonized or formerly colonized countries, um, things of that nature help get at uh, some of the um, financial questions, and again, they're very difficult because once you start talking about, um, you know, reallocation of money and reparations, um, it, it often becomes even harder because um, removing a statue or removing a plaque um, is a lot cheaper than, you know, creating a whole new scholarship program or rethinking the way financial, um, financial operations go. But even with the Rhodes House, again, we said, okay, Rhodes endowed this scholarship with money exploited from the labor of the black Southern African miners in his diamond mines and so on. Um, so we said, look, the, the Rhodes Scholarship historically has gone mostly to white men. I mean, it prohibited women until 1977. Um, and, uh, and that money, you know, given that it was exploited from the labor of black Southern Africans, should actually go to black Southern African students. Um, I think that's I think that's a, a fair a demand to make. And if there's other cases where um, financial institution or institutions um, have financial means that are, were ill-gotten, um, there, is, there is a space for restorative justice in that regard. Um, but yeah, I, I apologize. I have to run to, to my next uh, engagement. This has been a wonderful conversation and I, I really um, am grateful for the opportunity to participate. If people wanna know more about Roads Must Fall, obviously we have a book. Uh, called Roads Must Fall, um, which talks a lot about <laughs> a lot about the movement. So thanks again to um, to Allison and everybody who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you. So this would be a good time if anybody else has to take off for a one o'clock class. So a lot's come up. Is there any claims where anyone has been sort of waiting to say something or, or jump in with a comment? I would like to make a comment. Please. <laughs> so um, <laughs> one of the things that I uh, thought about uh, while I listened to the co conversation going is um, the question of, do you really have to remove all the memorials? Um, another way of doing it is, is to put another memorial right next to it, which then shows a different narrative. This is, uh, for instance, a solution that has been practiced in the city of Hamburg, where there is a, a World War I memorial to a regiment um, that fought uh, in Verdun, and the monument had been set up uh, uh, during um, the Nazi era in 1936. 
So it started a lot of discussion afterwards, um, after World War II, and a lot of people wanted to bring it down. But then, of course, you had lots of people who had died there and lots of, lots of mothers and fathers who lost their sons still alive. So as a result, they didn't want to bring it down in the end, but instead next to it, they built another memorial that is now commemorating those who died uh, and who were killed by the Nazi dictatorship during World War II, and particularly those uh, soldiers that tried to run away and then were, were shot on the spot. So uh, you have two memorials right next to each other. Are there other exam similar examples of sort of these kinds of tactics to um, reframe or recontextualize by but leaving things in place? Uh, yes, I mean, and this has been a question that's been hotly debated. You know, the question of how do we, re how do we reinterpret existing public monuments? I mean, Charlottesville is a very interesting case of that. Um, prior to the, you know, the the white supremacist rally and the murder of Heather Heyer in, in the couple of years before that, actually the city of Charlottesville had gone through this really interesting process, getting a lot of community input about the public monuments, Confederate monuments, but other monuments in Charlottesville, like what stories, the questions were, what is, the, what are the stories being told in, in the commemorative landscape? What's not being told? And what should we do with existing ones? What should we add? And so it was a kind of comprehensive almost survey of what might be possible, which is to me a, a really interesting idea because rather than doing it, rather than looking at case by case, oh, here we have a problematic monument, so we have to do something with that, is actually stepping back and looking at the community as a whole. What kind of stories are being told in this community? What is the history that's being shaped here in the, in the commemorative sphere and why? And so the question of reinterpreting the large, you know, the monument to Lee, for example came up in, in that, and most people in, in, in who participated in these workshops in Charlottesville realized or came to the realization that putting up a little plaque that says, oh, by the way, you know, Lee was implicated in slavery and the Confederate, you know, by the way, <laughs> this is pretty bad for the following reasons. Um, that that just wasn't, that wasn't adequate to the task. And so other people began to actually envision much more dramatic interventions that were really interesting, like putting a huge barbed wire fence around it and or putting a huge glass uh, barrier around it on which people would then post, there would be all kinds of interesting visual material posted on this glass, you know, um, uh, barrier about the history of slavery in Charlottesville. Um, and, the slave trade and so on, and fugitive slaves and all of that. So people began to really think about much more large scale interventions. All of this takes money and time and, and none of those, I, you know, it's doubtful that any of those are gonna ever reach fruition. Um, so that, that whole issue, how do we reinterpret the existing monumental landscape could be rethought in a more comprehensive, I think, whole holistic way than just uh, monument by monument, plaque by plaque. Uh, Jen, yes. Yeah, I, I want to follow up on this directly because I think one of the things that's been really interesting to me as a relative newcomer to Charlottesville is been to sort of see the ways in which people's thinking about the Confederate statues here has changed as a result of Unite the Right and the violence. Because I think one of the things that we haven't maybe made explicit in this discussion so far is that when you put monuments out in public, it's impossible to control how they are used and interpreted by people. And so I think that a lot of people, including members of the Blue Ribbon Commission, the, the city commission that did the study that Kirk was just talking about, who initially would have said that recontextualization, added monuments, um, to kind of rebalance the, the narratives, who, people who had initially advocated for that um, no longer think that's sufficient after August 11th and 12th because if the original is still there, it is still available for people who want to use it 
in ways that are harmful to members of the community. Um, and that the, 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 the solutions have to be put in the context of the stakes of the, of the commemorative culture. And that means something very different when you're talking about, you know, sort of, are the monuments still performing the terror that they were intended to perform when they were put up in the 1910s and the 1920s? <coughs> and whether the monuments are being sort of celebrated and used by people who are trying to enact that terror now in very physical, violent ways. Um, and so I think that the, you know, if we're thinking about interpretation and solutions, we have to take into account the ways in which that escapes the planners um, and, and think about what the stakes are of leaving, repurposing, and what the consequences might be of different choices in the real world, the pre present. Other other questions? Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so just just to point out, because if I forget, the mic is actually up there, and the people are there. It's it's awkward, but this, just letting you know. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I have a few questions, and maybe Katya can can speak to it. Um, they're both related to the the parks that seem to be commemorating uh, the communist period. I think you mentioned them in Lithuania. Um, so one of the questions uh, you said that there were it became a tourist attraction. There's a, a degree of popularity towards them, and I'm wondering if you think they're uh, you know, paying, uh, they reflect a degree of nostalgia for that period, and is it politically innocuous? And uh, the reason why I bring it up is that uh, when I was in China, uh, there are these uh, cultural revolution restaurants that are, uh, you know, they're not created by the state, they're created by, you know, private entrepreneurs, and you would think the cultural revolution period is this degree of, you know, really difficult period for people, but, um, you know, in the restaurant, uh, you know, people spontaneously uh, patrons spontaneously sang uh, red songs, songs by Mao, and it was reflective, in my opinion, of um, camaraderie, you know, that they had to endure in that period. So I was really surprised by, like, the joyfulness that people sang these red songs. So is it, is it politically innocuous? Uh, should we attribute any kind of meaning if, it, if these parks are popular? And the second question related to parks is about um, the civil society that grew um, out of the perestroika period. So I'm thinking about the memorial society that grew um, and took, this group was basically archiving uh, deaths during the Stalinist period. They were responsible uh, for trying to change uh, street signs to old Russian names. And this group exists now and they face police raids by the Putin regime. And so I'm kind of wondering uh, how do we reconcile you know, the trends, you know, by this group and what this group represents with the trend of these memorial parks because they're seemingly inconsistent or conflicting. Well, um, actually, those two things are um, not related at all because the park that I mentioned is in Lithuania and it is, um, it has been built by an entrepreneur who simply was trying to, to make money with those monuments and turned it into a tourist attraction, which is also highly frequented by lots of foreigners. Um, and it's in Lithuania where very clearly um, the old Soviet narrative has gone. And uh, yes, there is also a Russian minority in Lithuania, but it's rather small con compared to Latvia and Estonia. So as a result, um, the society is less split. And uh, yes, maybe some people that go there have Soviet nostalgia. Um, however, I think the majority of people that go there are just, um, it's, it's, it's just interest to see uh, all these monuments all brought there all together. Um, but it, it's, it's very not, it's not really political. Whereas, um, when I talk, when you when you think about Russia and uh, the um, institutions like Memorial in particular, yes, uh, they are under attack, and uh, this is very very dramatic, and it has of course to do with Putin's uh, and and this is something that has split over to the Baltic. 
so uh, I would argue that uh, the ground soldier protests that I mentioned at the beginning and the protest in 2007 are directly related to 2005 when Putin for the first time really um, essentially reinvented this holiday of May 9th and made it big again. And ever since then, this has big. Uh, since people in Russia are going to Soviet memorials, being reported about on Russian TV, and people in the Baltics, I say people, I say Russian speakers in the Baltics do the same thing and visit uh, old Soviet memorials there. Really interesting. Yeah. Is there any other question? Just something very briefly. Uh, to Katya, I really agree with you on this idea of having these artifacts, these statues in critically contextualized museums. And I thought maybe, uh, for instance, about the example of the Mama Museum, the World Museum in Berlin. And But I think that the measure is successful just as long as people visit these museums. So maybe we need something larger to inscribe all these ideas, this critical contextualization in the educational system. So how can we bridge this gap? And trying to bring all these ideas, all these concepts of, into a reform of our educational system, the curriculum, as we were saying before. So I think I think the question has to do with um, yeah, I think the question has to do with sort of if we have um, a space in museums, you need people to go to them and you need them to be understood. Is there a way to even put it into, say, the curriculum in like maybe primary or, or secondary schools to start these questions earlier? I think yes. And uh, I mean, th th this is being done. Um, in Germany, I know that this is being done, that they are trying to put this into curricula, not so much in primary schools, um, but definitely in secondary schools. Uh, of course, um, yes. remembering um, the Holocaust is a, is a very important part of uh, education in, in German uh, schools, not only in the subject of history, but also in other subjects such as, uh, um, well, German literature, uh, for instance, but even uh, ethics. Um, and so, yes, things like that are a part of it. And uh, with regard to memorials and memorialization, I think this is probably best being done uh, with, with, with study trips. And again, uh, this is something that, uh, for instance, uh, lots, of, lots of German school kids usually visit Berlin. And of course, then they go to the Holocaust Memorial, for instance, which is not only a memorial, but has a museum right next to it. So it's both. I always wonder, you know, there's um, things that come up, you know, over Silent Sam, the Department of History at the University of North Carolina now has a good, you know, site where they put up sort of comments that have been written by faculty members and resources that you can go to to look at. And, you know, we can look at a lot of these debates as teachable moments. Um, but I guess I wonder if you create a teachable moment around say, debates over the Confederate memorials or the colonial memorials, and then you are trying to present it as, two, as a two-sided debate as equal weight, is there? I mean, are you giving equal weight to an argument over the Confederacy as heritage? Or is there a way to balance it without sort of, I don't know, how, how much can you draw the line of the teachable moment for these? Um, right, so let, let me jump in on that. Um, uh, as somebody who, for example, used the Stephen Foster monument as a teachable moment over and over again, I mean, I actually used that in my almost almost every um, class I could figure out, if I could figure out some way to go to the Stephen Foster monument, I did. And um, Now what do you do? It's not there. Right, so now we have a, a different thing to talk about, which is the void. The void. Um, and we can use that as a teachable moment. Uh, uh, but to me, what we're what the larger issue that this uh, raises is the issue of reparation and 
Um, so we've been hearing a lot about kind of reactionary nostalgia for fascism or the Cultural Revolution or colonialism in France. Um, and so on the one hand, we have those, we, we have that phenomenon, which is a, a global phenomenon, but it also is, is very much true in the, United, in the United States of Silent Sam. I mean, a lot of this has to do with, you can see reactionary nostalgia in the United States if you, if you just want to go to a Sons of Confederate Veterans event, and you'll see a whole lot of reactionary nostalgia. Uh, here in this in this country for a time, uh, you know, that is mourned by um, particularly, you know, southern white men, let's say. Um, so against that, we then have this movement to to use the commemorative sphere as a space of reparation and to think about this. And Brian was talking a lot about this. So in a way, the focus becomes not just the monument, but it becomes the whole. Uh, apparatus that supports that monument that is in the university and the curriculum and the funding and the institutional structures and the funding structures that that surround that and can we use the monument in a way whether we keep it up or take it down can we use the monument as a way of exploring uh, that whole institutional apparatus and, and trying to determine what we need to do to repair the damage that that has caused so that's a conversation that has not happened in Pittsburgh around the Stephen Foster Monument, where it was just removed. And there's been really very little conversation about what that meant or what is the repair work that needs to be done in this city with, you know, that is represented by that, you know, by that monument. There's a long history that we're talking about here. And it is, as Brian said, it's active in the present in gentrification and the destruction of African-American communities that's happening right now in Pittsburgh. How do we tie the monument to that? Because that's really what brought the monument down in a certain sense. And how can we use this as a way to advance um, reparative work uh, in a much broader, broader sense, which is something that could ultimately perhaps counter the forces of reactionary nostalgia that we've been talking about so much here uh, around the table and, and with our partners. Interesting. Another question. Yeah, Kirk, you, I'm glad you brought this up because I actually wanted to um, to follow up about this. So I know, and I, maybe you can update a, a bit about what's going on, because I remember as soon as they took down the Stephen Foster Memorial, they had there was discussion of putting a memorial up to an African-American woman. Right that had been active in some form in Pittsburgh historically, and they had all of the pictures up of various people that they were considering, and you could weigh in as a citizen, you could go online, there was some public mm -hmm. forum. And then that, and to me, that was getting towards what you were just talking mm -hmm. about, but I haven't heard anything in the last <laughs> year or so, once they now took down all those pictures, um, if that's right. still part of, if that's still happening, or if there's been a new um, right. Discussion. Well, this is a, it's a great example. There's this very similar example in Philadelphia with the Rizzo monument where there was, you know, uh, Rizzo is the racist, former racist mayor and police chief of the city of uh, Philadelphia. And, uh, and an announcement was made that his monument was going to come down. We're, we don't know exactly when. And now the years have gone by and it's still there and nobody's really talking about what's going to happen to the Rizzo monument anymore. Um, same thing with Stephen, the Stephen mm -hmm. Foster. Memorial. So part of, I think, the problem is it was a very top-down process, right? It just came down. Nobody was consulted, but, you know, there's no consultation that I knew of. It was a kind of decision made by the mayor's office and the art commission uh, to do this. Not that it was a bad idea at all, mm -hmm. but just if there, there wasn't a community discussion around the idea, and that is going to require a lot of money to you know, so you can say we're going to do this, but then actually implementing it is a whole different story. So unless they, my understanding is, and I mean, don't quote me on this because I don't have any direct information, but um, if you don't have certain players involved in this foundations and other sources of money that are going to support that idea, it's not going to happen. And they didn't go to the foundation. I know they didn't go to the foundation community in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, for example, mm -hmm. so uh, it's not like the city of Pittsburgh is going to spend a half a million dollars of its own money mm -hmm. on a new monument. Mm 
there. It's just not going to happen. So again, it points to the whole. Yeah. It points to the question of process, right? I mean, how do we open this up in the way that kind of Brian's group opened that discussion up in a really, I think, um, useful way to include not just the statute, but to actually raise much deeper questions. How do we? How could we do that with Stephen Foster? The void here. Mm -hmm. The void to me is the <laughs> void of discussion, the void of reparation. You know, how do we fill that void with something? I wonder, Katya, do you have a sense of how much sort of public consultation has been done in some of the cases that you were looking at, some of the, some of the public memory sites? Or how much was just top down in terms of making decisions? Well, of course it depends. I would, however, reiterate what uh, Jen mentioned at the beginning, that a lot of this is very local. Um, so often when it comes down to those smaller monuments about World War II, uh, for instance, there, there are numerous monuments in Germany about uh, uh, certain regiments that fought in World War II and they just put them up and then uh, only now, about 60, 70 years later, they realize well, uh, there's no research being done now, and now we know that um, certain members of this 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 regiment actually were involved in were involved in war crimes. So, what are we going to do with this this monument? And so, um, they have added uh, certain plaques. This is something that's usually done by local actors, civil society. That's it's very active. That's very important. Um, so, a lot of it is very local. Um, then, of course, there are those big monuments uh, that, like, for instance, the Holocaust Memorial in, in Berlin, in Germany, that, of course, is a drop down state decision. It, it took years to decide about it. Uh, it took years about to have it built. Um, so, so I think um, it's it's different. It's definitely both. Um, you you have both local actors very active, but you also have state actors um, who try to essentially say, well, this is our narrative. This is how we want history to be interpreted, and this is what we're also teaching in schools. And yeah, Jen, please. Oh, just a minute. We need to we need to unmute you. She's muted on. Oh, you need to be unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Um, no, I think th this is a really important question, and the 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 question about money and the question about civil society, um, and the role of the state and the role of local communities matters. And and I might sort of take this moment to recommend to people who are interested an essay in the Roads Must Fall volume that Brian was showing by um, the British historian Olivet Otel, or a historian in Britain, um, who, who wrote an essay that was published first on Open Democracy and is now in the, in the Roads Must Fall volume called What Britain Can Learn from France, um, in which she points to kind of memorial strategies that have been adopted around the, the commemoration of enslavement and, and the slave trade in France. Um, that kind of run all of up and down all of these levels um, that include you know, sort of changing street names and putting up new monuments that commemorate the um, the, the the victims of the slave trade and of enslavement, um, but also points to the ways in which memorial spaces are used as places to tell stories and places where more inclusive historical narratives can be um, sort of can can be can be put together, um, including you know museums and 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 spaces like in um, the city of Le Havre, which is one of the the major French port on the the uh, English Channel, that has a a building that was sort of the center of the of the slave traders who were um, who sailed out of Le Havre, that is now being used as a conference space focused on questions about the colonial past. And that's become a space for discussions, um, academics, members of civil society, members of the community, um, to talk about that past. And particularly in conjunction with the creation of a national holiday, 
commemorating the abolition of slavery that becomes a point where school curricula, field trips, you know, can be can can center on um, these questions. And so I think you know, if we, if, again, going back to the issue about how monuments are used, um, this really matters. And, and Charlottesville is another really good example. You know, the 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 Confederate monuments are still here for now. Um, and one of one of a faculty member at UVA and the director of the Thomas Jefferson or the um, the uh, Historical Society in Charlottesville, one of the African American Historical Society in Charlottesville, do walking tours of the Confederate monuments where they talk about mm -hmm. the history of the monuments, why they were put up, what they have meant over time, and what they mean to people today. And so the 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 idea of um, having having these as places that can be used to tell stories um, and and to tell more inclusive stories about the past um, seems really important as well as part of that reparative work. This has been really interesting. I want to thank everybody. Every, um, we're going to try to get um, pictures in the public domain of all these the memorials that we've been talking about. So they'll go up in a company so people can look at those. But we'll also put up links to the books that we've mentioned and some of the articles and to books that are, have been authored by our panelists. But I wanted to take a moment to thank all of our panelists because unfortunately we run out of time, even though I'm sure we could talk about a lot more uh, and keep going. But I did want to point to um, our next event in this series of politics and memory seems really germane to this. And we have a DAAD um, speaker coming in. And unfortunately, Jan had to leave, um, or I would have let him tell us about it. But um, we're having the former director of um, the Museum of the Second World War in Gdansk, who was removed by the um, Polish government when the Law and Order Party came in, or the Law and Justice Party, sorry. Um, over how he was representing or how the museum was representing um, uh, Poland's role in World War II. So that should be a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. and it speaks to a lot of some of these same questions about how things are remembered and, and in what ways that's portrayed to the public. So thank you all for joining us and um, thanks to everybody remotely. Bye-bye.